why I'm not an atheist. I was never really tempted with atheism uh, ever since I went to college and started my trek into the world of philosophy since 18, 19, I've had a lot of debates with atheists. We used to debate atheists all the time on campus. In the philosophy club, we would have constant debates. So I'm very familiar with atheist argumentation. I had a lot of atheist professors, and I even debated atheist professors when I was a, a sophomore. I had a public debate with my philosophy of science professor at the time. So I'm very familiar with various atheist positions. It's a, it's a position I've interacted with probably for 20 years now, uh, so maybe 21, 22 years. So I want to be uh, as fair as I can. I don't want to, want to give uh, mis misrepresentations. I know that there's a lot of different views that, that fall under atheism. I know that, that some people conceive of atheism as agnosticism, just simply saying that we don't know, we can't know. And then other more hardcore positions that well, there absolutely is no kind of higher being nothing transcendental, etc. So I'm going to give my 10 uh, reasons. They're not really in a specific order, just like the other top 10s, why I'm not a Catholic, why I'm not a Protestant. You can watch those videos uh, right before this. Um, and here we want to just kind of list the main reasons that occur to me. So if you follow a lot of my debates, if you've seen a lot of those, a lot of the interactions that we've had, a lot of the lectures uh, then you probably know some of these, you probably heard a lot of these, but let's try to boil it down to something uh, uh, as quick as we can for a, a top 10. So the first one would be the transcendental argument. I think the transcendental argument is uh, the strongest argument for God's existence, and it's because it shows the necessity of God's existence in a logical framework. It can be written out as a syllogism. We've given uh, many examples of that syllogism. If you listen to the debate that I did with Dr. Malpass, you'll notice that towards the end of the debate, I listed a syllogism there that could work. But basically, uh, the, everything that we engage in in this world relies on everything that we use in this world, such as uh, mathematics, logic, abstract, conceptual entities. They all presume uh, what are called transcendental categories. Right? They rely on things that are not known or proven through mere sense experience. So we could think about things like temp, uh, spatio-temporal relations. We could think about things like the past. We could think about things like objects having identity over time. We could we could think about things like uh, the transcendental unity of a self, right? That there is a, a uh, self-existing some, something. <laughs> I know that atheists won't say that there's a soul, but there's something that's having this experience of the world that is a unified conscious experience, right? Whatever terms you want to use to call that. These are, in philosophy, titled things like transcendentals. They're, they're things that are assumed for the possibility of reason or logic at all. And if you were to deny, deny any one of these, you would actually undercut and negate the possibility of logic or philosophy or reasoning or meaning or knowledge whatsoever. And so that's why they're so strong and so powerful is that they're necessary for a worldview at all. Now, a person can theoretically deny these things and, and continue to have a worldview, pragmatically speaking, but at that point, they're just being inconsistent. And so when we bundle all of these things together, these transcendental categories that are necessary, again, for cognition, for meaning, for objectivity, et cetera, et cetera, for consciousness, for knowledge, for ethics, then what we get is a bundle that doesn't stand on its own. How do we justify those things? Do they do we, do we just say that they are? Well, they actually do need to be grounded. They need to be made coherent and they need to be strung together, so to speak, on a, um, you, could, you could think of it like a golden string of pearls that strings together all these transcendental things. And that is the mind of God himself. The mind of God is the uh, uh, basis, the ground for these things. And although it may sound kind of counterintuitive, uh, it is, you can logically show this. Uh, now, we've done this in many, many talks. I'll put some of those talks down below for a longer presentation. But essentially, any worldview that doesn't have that as its grounding, any worldview that tries to do materialism as its uh, uh, basic metaphysical or physicalist assumption uh, ends up in relativism. It ends up in self-contradiction at a very fundamental level. So I would say that, <clears throat> that the, the transcendental argument itself 
uh, is this, the first reason that I would believe in God's existence because it shows that reasoning itself presupposes the Christian God. The second reason that I would not be an atheist is that we utilize all these things like meaning, like logic, like math, and we think about those abstract conceptual things, but there's also other things like love, like beauty, aesthetics, things that relate to the world like telos or causality. Those things in themselves can't be empirically dem demonstrated. They're actually assumed. And so they're kind of like the transcendental categories that I mentioned before, things like causality and telos would be. Uh, and I would argue that you could even include perhaps aesthetics in that category, right? That it's actually impossible to live your life as if the good is purely subjective. And that's what I think is amazing here is that even such basic philosophical assumptions like whether there's an external world ultimately can't be justified unless you have a world grounded in an external being like the mind of God and not in our own subjective experience. And so essentially these, another, another one of these key assumptions would be that your senses match up to an external world, right? Uh, we all kind of assume that in our dialogue and our discourse and our daily living, but can we actually empirically verify that claim? No, you can't. It has to be assumed uh, and it can't be empirically verified. Now, how do we prove that if we can't empirically verify it? Well, the first point that we always say is that rank empiricism and most atheists, not everybody, but most atheists are naive rank empiricists. They believe that we only know what's true from a sense data and from sense experience. The problem with this, of course, is that you cannot prove that proposition, that belief itself from sense experience. And so therefore it's at a fundamentally, uh, it's at a fundamental level, it's very contradictory. Uh, so much so that it can't even get off the ground. So I would say if you look at things like, again, beauty, uh, beauty relates to form and symmetry. And if you took something like a Mandelbrot set as an example, a Mandelbrot set shows that this mathematical structure, this set based on set theory, uh, is not something that is invented by the mind of man. Uh, and now a lot, not all, but a lot of atheists will say that mathematics is a social construct. It's a human invention. It's not something that's actually being discovered like you were, you know, going out and discovering, uh, you know, Antarctica or something like this, right? But in fact, a lot of mathematicians will speak of mathematics as a landscape of discovery that, that when somebody discovers something like a Mandelbrot set, they're not inventing it. They're actually discovering something, right? And that shows that these are not products of our mind, but they exist in some kind of realm beyond our minds. Ultimately, that's the mind of God. Uh, and I have an essay where I argue about this kind of stuff called Numbers Prove God, where I flesh that out more. So if you want to go deeper into that, I'll leave that link in the pinned comment below. So there's also a great lecture by Dr. Jason Lyle on Mandelbrot sets. I'll include that in the link as well. Again, this is a, just a top 10. I can't prove every single proposition and every single argument in a top 10 video. Uh, so the ba the backing for these claims, because I know there's going to be atheists in the comments saying, you didn't prove nothing. You just stated your position of transcendental arguments. Just stated the position. It's not an argument. I'm, uh, I'll, I'll include the argumentation in the pinned comment. The next argument I would say is that uh, nihilism is the end result of atheism. Now, not every atheist might want to go in this direction, but I think if you read Father Seraphim Rose's great philosophical presuppositional critique of revolutionary thought and atheism, atheism is just one of the flavors of revolutionary thought. I'm speaking of modern atheism since the Enlightenment. And it, it, it leads to nihilism. I think he proves that case that there's a kind of a dark logic that nihilism takes you down as you come to what's called in philosophy epistemological self-consciousness. And all that means is just that you are going to, over time, become more and more consistent with your governing presuppositions. So if your governing presupposition is atheism and materialism, you're going to become more and more consistent with that and end up in nihilism. And we can actually see the logic of this uh, as it works out in Western thought, for example. Uh, if we go back to the Enlightenment, to the scientific revolution, you have the rise of rationalism, you have the rise of these universal uh, enlightenment ideals. And then within a, a few centuries, this, this degenerates into uh, postmodernism and then into just sort of will to power Nietzscheanism and then to just full on nihilism. And then there have been uh, uh, quite a few nihilist philosophers. Uh, some of the Russian 
uh, uh, revolutionaries were openly nihilistic. V.I. Lenin was pretty nihilistic in his philosophy. So there's, there's, there is a real progression to that uh, dark left-hand path, you could say, uh, of being more consistent with one's uh, nihilistic assumptions. And so even though stage one atheism might not be nihilistic, the end result, if you're being consistent, is nihilistic because there's not really any reason for anything. There's no reason to do X over Y. There's no reason that this is preferable to that. And in, in, in effect, all actions are perfectly equalized. And if all actions are perfectly equalized, it doesn't matter what happens. It just is. And as Hume said, you can't get an ought from an is. You can't get a standard, an objective, any kind of value judgment from a mere is. Right? Something just The fact that something is the case does not lead to the conclusion that something ought to be or you should do this or you ought to do that. That's the domain of ethics. And uh, atheism and materialism cannot provide any objective standard of ethics. Now, you can say things like, well, but you got to be nice to people. You shouldn't harm people. But why? Why? The natural world is full of predator-prey relations. Why not harm people? Why not, why not crush uh, everyone that I want and uh, take my own harem of everyone else's wives and start my own cult and make me the Ubermensch, right? Why not? There's no, there's no reason why you shouldn't do that. Uh, there's no reason for anything. Events just are. And so ultimately, again, the, the problem here is that on this position, you have a situation where even your own consciousness is just a series of chemical reactions. It's not a real, there's nothing underlying these, these uh, phenomenal experiences. The, there's nothing underlying these chemical reactions. There's no actual meaning to them. They just are. And I think that that's uh, severely problematic. The next point I would make is uh, not uh, ultimately a proof of the position as a whole, but as I've gotten older, I think that, that uh, the proof against atheism, but it's, it's an analysis that I do think is worthy of mentioning. Again, it's not strictly a logical argument against the position because you could use this argument against a lot of different views. But uh, I've seen this more and more as I've gotten older, especially after many years of 20 years of looking at the world of atheism and watching the the new atheists and those guys uh, uh you know 10 years ago or so coming to popularity is that atheism is really part of a larger social engineering tool atheism is not just a bunch of uh, people who are seeking through altruistic reasons to find the truth and to be logical and to be rational and to be scientific in fact atheism is promoted by very powerful wealthy people Again, not just because of people uh, uh, nobly wanting to see what's true and, and dispel superstitions, but actually to take society at a, as a, at a, in a larger sense in a certain direction. And if you study the history of revolutionary movements, which I did extensively in college and grad school, you'll learn about uh, worldviews and ideologies being weaponized. I mean, the CIA has done this for many years. I've written two books that deal with, with this very topic. Uh, my master's degree was on uh, the way that the CIA utilizes ideologies in, in specifically in the Cold War. And so when you when you study that for a long time, you'll notice that ideologies, even things like atheism, can be psychological warfare tools. And I didn't know that as a young guy. Even when I started debating atheists, I had no idea that that uh, something like psychological warfare and social engineering could be that sophisticated. And of course, it absolutely is. And I would say that when you look at the modern day atheists, a lot of them actually are being propped up by the system, by the establishment. And that's why they all sort of tout the system establishment line. They don't really deviate from anything that's establishment. They're all just kind of establishment mouthpieces. Uh, and I think that that's very telling that if they were really uh, seeking out for altruistic reasons, uh, the truth, uh, the, the, you know, the, the noble scientist kind of a uh, guy who's willing to risk it all for the truth if that was really the case then why do they line up uh, across the board on all of the kind of normie takes on everything whether it's tyson bill nye or or michael Shermer or whoever it's all just the same type of normie stuff and i think that that's very suspicious and suspect and they're just establishment pop mouthpieces and that's a big i think blow to to the validity of the of these uh, pop atheists who are, who are still sort of out there promoting this worldview. So it's a very naive approach, right? It's a naive approach uh, in terms of understanding the world as if atheism and the atheist 
um, thinkers and, and, and writers aren't being supported by the system for the purpose of taking society in a direction. And, and, and ultimately, you can watch my globalism book series to see what direction they want to go in. And after reading 40 plus books and lecturing on them from the, the top elite of the last century, you can absolutely see uh, that atheism is a tool for social engineering. We just saw this with the H.G. Uh, Wells book that we did, God the Invisible King. The next, uh, I would say, is that uh, pragmatically speaking, atheists always want to appeal to pragmatic arguments. So, oh, it doesn't work. Christianity doesn't work. It leads to uh, oppression. It leads to uh, you know superstition. It's this, that. Uh, do atheist societies actually work? I don't think so. I mean, again, the problem here is that when we use the word work, what work assumes that we have um, some sort of uh, gradation, some sort of benchmark, some sort of value judgment by which we can we can uh, determine and assess whether things do or do not work, right? So that's, once again, to say that atheist societies work, that's going to be conditioned on your presuppositions themselves. You're going to read what, what works uh, based on your presuppositions, right? So, for example, if if I think that uh, it's good to depopulate, and I so I killed off most, you know, Georgia Guidestones. Let's say we kill off most of the world, uh, or something like this, down to five hundred million. If I believe that that is good, then I think that that works. If I think that that works, I believe it's good, right? So the problem with pragmatism is that it it on the one hand assumes a uh, objective standard, while at the same time typically denying objective standards. And that's incoherent. That's a contradiction. That's being illogical. It's a violation of, uh, of logic. So the point being is that if we want to be pragmatic and we want to say, well, does it work? Well, if you are anti-human, I guess it does work, right? I mean, if you think that it's good to uh, have some sort of entity that enacts mass death or something like this, a, a communist state, uh, a, a technocratic state that's going to depopulate on a, on a mass scale, then it does work, right? Now, I know that there could be atheists who say, well, we don't want that. We want, uh, you know, the Charter of Human Rights or something like this. But the real, but, but again, the reason here, the, the, the argument I'm making here is that there is no reason to prefer one or the other, right? If you try to say that, well, we should protect the life of XYZ and we should not protect the life of ABC, there's no real objective reason to delineate between why we should or should not, because shoulds and should nots are the domain of ethics. And in this worldview, there's absolutely no, no coherent basis for objective ethics. Now, I know that there are atheist philosophers who think that they can give a basis for some kind of objective ethics or secular ethics or something like this, but they can't. Uh, because there's no such thing, again, as objective standards. There's no such thing as metaphysics in this position because most modern atheism, again, maybe you can find a guy here or there, but most modern atheism comes out of the tradition of David Hume, the, the classic skeptic, the denial of metaphysics, and the denial of these sort of uh, absolute concrete metaphysical principles. And when you do that, you kind of box yourself in and you're, you're limited in the options of where you can go in terms of things like ethics. And so I would say that atheism actually doesn't work and it doesn't produce a, quote, healthy society. Because what we conceive of as healthy and what we conceive of as working is actually going to be based on our presuppositions. And if our presuppositions are false or incorrect, then they're going to lead to incorrect conclusions. And so if, for example, we look at, uh, say, radical anarchism as an atheist position, or if we look at radical socialism or communism or dictatorship fascism whatever as perhaps to then then really all you have is a dialectic at work there's no reason to pre preserve uh, to, to prefer or to think that one is better than the other now you might like the individual anarcho position better because maybe it affords you the opportunity to uh, engage in more personal pleasures or something like that but on what basis is this does that mean that's actually true right so because you prefer or you enjoy more pleasures within a libertarian anarcho system of atheism as opposed to a collectivist system of atheism. It's just completely arbitrary and ad hoc. There's actually not a reason for one or the other. And to say, well, it's just what I want, that's called being arbitrary. That's called being ad hoc. That's not actually giving a reason. That's just being subjective. So once again, it boils always boils. If you look at the debate with JF, you look at the debate with any of the other atheists I've had, it always boils back down to subjectivism. <laughs> And even if you bring in things like universally preferred behavior or something like that, that's just as arbitrary. It's just as ad hoc. 
And it's just as subjective and not able to be grounded in objective principles. Because again, atheism is grounded in a movement against objective metaphysical principles. 99% of the time. The next argument I would say is that ultimately then atheism is anti-human. Now, again, if you're an atheist, there's a, there's a tension in a lot of atheism between, on the one hand, wanting to be, we're secular humanists. We believe in the you know good of man and, and man rising up and the, the power of human reason. And, and at the same time, man is conceived of as this buffoon, this, this, this entity that's a kind of cancer on mother earth that you know most humans because they don't have you know iq 150 or above all we got to get rid of all of them and so there's this dialectical tension between humanism so-called and on the other hand anti-humanism right and when you get to the root of the humanist movement you'll see that most of them they're not humanists they want most people to die i mean look at the history of the depopulation movement look at the rockefeller foundation look at the 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 communist regimes, uh, all the murder, all this stuff. When you try to instantiate these utopian kind of systems, they lead to disaster because this world is not utopian. Uh, And it leads to disaster because atheism itself is a false philosophy. It doesn't work. It actually is not pragmatic, although it claims to be pragmatic. So I would say that when you have a system where there's no image of of God, where where man's not made in the image of God, then uh, all... Uh, human rights are worthless and meaningless. There's not really any human rights because you're not damaging. You're not. Uh, you're not being held to an objective standard because all standards are relative. All right. So atheism is the dehumanization of man, and the global elite actually understand that, and that's why they foster atheism to demoralize and to br- to brutalize you, so that you are then more malleable for the social engineering. Right. From soy wars, from video games, from all the replacement stuff that you get from the system to make you feel like you're a a male, to give you synthetic masculinity, sports, all this nonsense. Right. Those are all your replacement masculine uh, uh, idols. Right. Uh, Which really ultimately you would get in being grounded in real philosophy, being grounded in. Uh, real metaphysics, real epistemology, ultimately in theology, right? So all of this stuff is a replacement for that. Next, I would say that uh, atheism is materialistic, ultimately. Uh, Most of the time, again, 99%. You could have an atheist who believes, oh, well, we just live in a dream simulation. Oh, we just live in some kind of like matrix. We live in, it's all Maya, it's all solipsism, right? And my argument here is that ultimately atheism can't, as we mentioned earlier, this idea of uh, the senses matching up to the external world. Do you actually know? And can you prove that there's an external world? I'm, sa- I'm speaking logically here, right? So these are dilemmas that, again, uh, atheist philosophers have raised, like David Hume. And, and the, the inability to prove these kinds of claims logically, all the way up to William Van Orman Quine and his Two Dogmas of Empiricism, where he restates the arguments of Hume, a lot of these kinds of things you can't actually prove empirically. And this is why atheistic philosophy is so bankrupt, is that it actually doesn't understand the limitations that it puts itself in to actually undermine logic itself, to undermine philosophy. And so if, if all that exists is material, matter, then not only can you not know that, because that's actually a metaphysical claim, it's a universal claim, first of all, uh, you can't actually ultimately know that the external world is not just a projection of your own psyche. And some uh, have gone in that direction. Some people actually do believe that. And I would say that, so So again, if you, if you know the history of Western philosophers, when they debate this kind of topic, they, they come to that conclusion because they say things like, well, if we're just basing our worldview on our sense data, all we have is impressions, right? Like, solidity, uh, senses of smell, sight, right? Those are just sort of things that impress themselves upon us. We don't actually know what's out there in the external world itself, right? At what Kant called the ding an sich. We only know the phenomenal experiences that we have. So it's entirely possible, if you think about a dream state, right, that all of those exterior sense uh, impressions that are being pressed upon us uh, are just mental phantasms, right? 
And if they're just mental phantasms, then we don't, we don't actually know if there's an external world. And you can't empirically demonstrate that. This is the kind of question that Descartes raises, right? Now, I don't believe that as a Christian. I believe that obviously there's an external world. What I'm saying is that atheistic philosophy, because it basically takes what, what we would say is true of the mind of God, and it tries to smush that into the mind of man. And ultimately, in atheism, man tries to take on the role of God. It's man attempting to, in a Promethean sense, be God. And it still believes in God. It still has the attributes and and. and and necessity for God, but it all places that within the mind of finite, meaningless man. Man, what is man in this system? He's just a drop of dust, a drop, a bag of uh, of human cells, a bag of cells, basically chemical reactions in an infinite, vast universe of meaninglessness, doing meaningless things, bubbling over. Right, your words, your con- this is just just chemical reactions. There's no meaning here, and then he turns back to dust. It's meaningless. And yet he spends his time, his days, fighting theism, fighting the things that he thinks are suppressing. Why are you, why do you even care about people being suppressed? Right? Why do you care about superstition? Why do you care about being noble, fighting for what's true, being rational, being logical? It's a giant, meaningless universe. So those things are all meaningless. I remember being at a debate one time, and, and the, again, I always bring this up because it's a great example, where the atheist, uh, uh, after the debate, came over to us and was talking, and he said, you know, I don't get your argument. He said, I think that really, ultimately, the real root of all this, he said, is that you are afraid to embrace the fact that the universe is ultimately meaningless. I said, do you really believe that? He said, yeah, absolutely. I said, so would that mean that you believe your own life is meaningless? And he said, absolutely. And I'm not afraid to say that. He said, I have the courage to own up to admitting that my life is meaningless. And I said, well, if your life is meaningless, that would mean that this day today is meaningless, right? He said, yeah, sure. It's all meaningless. I said, if this day today that we're experiencing right now is meaningless, is that, does that also mean that the conversation, the words that you're saying to me are meaningless? And he sat there for a minute and he said, you know, I'm tempted to bite the bullet here, but you're just playing word games. <laughs> well, of course, you have to bite the bullet here, right? If, if you believe that that's all meaningless, then you're part of this meaningless thing and your arguments are meaningless. And if your arguments are meaningless, then I have done my job as an apologist to show the incoherence and the foolishness of this position. And so once again, that's an example of the transcendental argument where somebody's utilizing something that, that's completely incoherent on their position, but it actually makes sense. If God exists and the world is as we believe in Christianity, then there are metaphysical principles. There are ethical absolutes. There is the possibility of having knowledge and certitude. There is regularity in nature because of divine providence. But on that system, there's not, and it's all meaningless. So I would say that uh, atheism, as we said, assumes all of these standards. This is my ninth reason. And this includes things like morals and absolutes, right? It assumes the things that are necessary to refute Christianity that only make sense within a theistic or Christian worldview to try to argue against it. And so it's it's essentially uh, sitting on the limb like a cartoon character as it saws the limb off, right? Let me give an example of this. If you think about Wittgenstein, Wittgenstein says all words are word games. Language is just word games. It's just, it's just tricking people. It's just this kind of stuff. He says that ultimately, if you just deconstruct all language is meaningless, but he just wrote a book with, you know, a hundred, 200 pages admitting words are meaningless using words that are to convince you that words are meaningless. So he's conveying meaning. A, an objectively true thing, he thinks, utilizing meaninglessness and ultimately saying his book is mean. That's a basic presuppositional critique. It's nonsense. It's foolishness. All atheism ends in this very same bucket trash bin of foolishness and, and philosophical incoherence at a fundamental level. Lastly, um, I would say that if you look at atheism, for all of its claims of uh, being rational, being scientific, it relies on outstanding, outlandish miracles. It relies on things like knowing that there was the past. It relies on claims about uh, aeons ago, what happened 11 million, what the, what the monkey was doing uh, literally 11 million years ago in Africa. 
right? Jacques Adelie talks about this. Total, not, not, totally not observed. No one has observed this. You, you don't observe the transitions between these so-called species. There's no observations of things. They're just postulated. And they're usually uh, argued for on the basis of authority. Appeals to authority, right? So you can't prove the self. The self is assumed in every, every argument that the atheist uses to argue against Christianity. You can't prove meaning. And yet, as we saw, the atheist argues that the uh, world, the universe ultimately is meaningless as he utilizes words to argue against words and meaning. Uh, you can't know or prove the past. Uh, these are, again, transcendental categories. But yet these things are magically believed to exist and to have occurred. And ultimately, uh, the whole world coming out of nothing, the Big Bang, right? Magical superstition. All the Big Bang is, is a original miracle for secular atheists. And it's ludicrous. All mass was compacted into a tiny infinitesimal dot, and then it exploded? That's total nonsense. Total baloney. Something came from nothing. That's absurd. Life came, consciousness came from nothing. Those are called miracles, secular miracles. And ultimately, through the transcendental argument, we consistently deconstruct and show that these positions are nonsense and are absurd. And they can't do, that's why you get people like Neil deGrasse Tyson saying, don't do philosophy, stay away from that realm. I don't even mess with it. It's, uh, it's all nonsense. Oh yeah, exactly. Because it shows the absurdity of this worldview. So thank you for watching this top 10. That's my 10 reasons. Uh, if you disagree, give me your, your comments below. I'll have in the pinned comment uh, the links to the more fleshed out versions of these arguments and these, these, uh, these points that I made. Uh, leave me a like, leave me a share if you enjoy, and uh, look for the next top 10 in the next few days. Thank you. If you like this analysis, be sure to click subscribe and give me a thumbs up down below. Also, be sure to check out Jay's analysis. Uh, and definitely click the bell down below to be sure you get the updates.